Welcome back to the Cutler Report. So, after Congressman Ron Paul's strong second place finish in New Hampshire, he is winning plaudits everywhere. And I ask again this evening, can the GOP find a home for the principles of free market Austrian economic message? Let's ask the man himself joining us now live, Texas Republican Congressman and presidential hopeful Ron Paul. Dr. Paul, as always, welcome back. Before we begin, sir, take Thank a you. listen to what South Carolina Senator Jim DeMint told me yesterday. Okay. Probably Ron Paul's the only one willing to say we really need to cut the budget and we need to, to cut some of the functions of the federal government. The Republicans must recognize that Ron Paul's message of limited government, individual liberty, more accountability at the Federal Reserve, better monetary policy, these are things that need to be core principles in the Republican Party. All right, uh, Congressman Paul, you heard the influential Senator Jim DeMint, influential in South Carolina and across the country. Do you believe now, okay, after your uh, semi-victory in New Hampshire, you had a good close second, do you believe that there's room in the GOP for your principles? Well, there, there better be or there won't be much left of the party because we're really talking about the fundamentals that they claim they believed in for a long time. I mean, for cutting spending and balancing budgets and sound money. I mean, uh, that's what we've talked about, you know, all the way back to the 80s, but we never followed through is the problem. And then in the, you know, uh, in this uh, century, you know, in the first decade, uh, we had the House and the Senate and the presidency. And I think we blew it. We doubled the size of the Department of Education. Uh, we had prescription drug program. And then we had that Sarbanes-Oxley. And I, I'm told that could have cost the business community a trillion dollars. So, uh, no, I, I think they better pay attention to those of us who believe in free markets and uh, not just give lip service to us or, uh, you know, they're not going to do well. Congressman, uh, Charles Krauthammer, of all people, wrote a very complimentary article about you. And I want to ask you about one of his key points. He believes that if you can't get the nomination, you should deliver one of the keynote speeches at the Republican convention to push your principles. Would you do that? Would you give a keynote speech? Is that something that appeals to you? Well, I think so. I uh, don't want them to write it for me, uh, but uh, I appreciate Charles's comments. Uh, he's another fellow physician, I, I guess you know. So uh, I, uh, I think that's a real nice compliment. But uh, of course, if I could write the speech, I think I'd be very interested in doing it. All right, good. Now, on to South Carolina. As you know, it's a pro-defense uh, state. There's a lot of military bases. There's contractors. There's builders. You have a relatively anti-war message. Are there going to be difficulties? on that point. You're closing pretty good, but is the defense message going to be difficult for South Carolina primary voters? Well, so far, I don't think so, because, you know, we have ads running down there, and I think that's helped switch some people over. And uh, I think most people are aware of the fact that I get twice as much money from active military personnel than all the other Republican candidates put together. So I'm getting a lot of support uh, from the military, and I always got a lot of support from veterans. So I think it's a fallacy to think that everybody in the military automatically wants to expand war. I remember the 60s. I was in. That's the last thing I wanted LBJ to do in 1965 was to expand the war in Vietnam and go over into Cambodia. That, that concerned me to a great deal. So I think that's a normal reaction. Uh, but I think people go into the military to defend the country, and they're willing to do it. But if it's fighting a war that isn't declared or under a UN banner or NATO, and you get bogged down for 10 years, and it contributes to our financial crisis, people can get pretty tired of that. And I think the American people are real tired of our foreign policy in the Middle East right now. You have copiously avoided attacking Mitt Romney and the Bain Capital flack about private equity companies. Obviously, Gingrich and Perry have. Why have you avoided attacking Mitt Romney? What point, what principle do you want to make on this? Well, of course, I'm willing to attack him on, uh, on you know, some of the policies that he's had before and we disagree on, and I've done that and used the word flip-flopping on many occasions, but not attack him on Baines. Uh, you know, they've asked me about it, and I said explicitly that that's part of the market. That's the way the market works. Restructuring is a market principle, and those who are jumping on him, either they don't understand economics, or if they do understand economics, they're demagoguing the issue for trying to make a political point. So in 
in that sense, you know, it came out, it looked like I was, you know, defending Mitt. And in that case, I was because uh, it's very important that you cleanse a system. If, it, if a company's going bankrupt and you don't have restructuring, everybody suffers. And, but if you can get some restructuring and you can create jobs. I don't know the details of everything he did, and I don't want to vouch for that. But the whole principle that they were attacking him on, I think it was false. Besides, they misquoted him anyway. All he said was, you know, that, well, if a company doesn't provide a service for me, I should change companies. Well, if you don't understand, that's important. That's what a businessman would do. Let me ask you a Fed question I, I can't resist. Um, the minutes of the Fed's meeting five years ago, you know, they unlocked these minutes with a five-year time lag. It shows in the transcript, sir, that Bernanke and company completely missed the financial and housing meltdown. In fact, in 2006, where these minutes come from, Bernanke said, it is unlikely to see growth derailed by the housing market. Now, the Federal Reserve System, Federal Reserve System has hundreds of PhD economists. How is it possible that they completely missed the worst meltdown since the 1930s? Because they follow the wrong uh, ideas on economics and they don't look at the business cycle being related to what they're doing in the Fed. Otherwise, they would have to indict themselves. So, uh, and he was following through with uh, Greenspan. Uh, he was doing the same thing and they were in total denial. But uh, you know that if you go back and look at some of the Austrian economists and uh, the Hayekians uh, and Misians, uh, they explained this. They were right about it. The only thing that we don't claim is that we know the exact data the bubble will burst. But we can identify bubbles. We know where they come from. And when they burst, you have to have a correction, and then you have to have unemployment. But the more, the more you interfere with the correction, the longer the correction lasts. And this is why this correction is lingering, and why if we don't get more people to understand the business cycle. The fact is, I think you make an important point. They have hundreds of, uh, of economists all through the university system, but they know they don't get the job unless they say what the Fed wants them to say. They, there's no independence. So don't ever expect uh, independent thinking at the Federal Reserve. They're there to defend a policy that is a total failure and has been, and we have to change it. All right, we have to change it. Many thanks, Congressman Ron Paul. Sir, good luck on the campaign trail. We appreciate you coming back. Coming up, folks, Mitt Romney and private equity are still under attack.